So continuing with realism and impressionism, we go to an American artist um, who eventually moved to Paris and then London, uh, and that's James Abbott Neil Whistler. And I can guarantee you've seen his paintings before, but not really ones that are necessarily important for this class. Um, usually when I get to this part and I do this class um, in real life, I ask the students what they think about Whistler in the picture. And most of the people see what the artist was probably intending when he was making fun of him a little bit. Uh, he's like a dandy, uh, meaning he dresses a little too fine. Uh, and you can kind of see that by the way his clothes is, are cinched in the waist. He's got this tiny little cane uh, and he's smoking what's trendy at this time, which is a cigarette. You know, you wouldn't catch yourself smoking a pipe. And of course he's got um, a monocle. So he's, he's kind of being stylish and, and the look on his face where it's scrunched up, it looks like he's judging us. Um, so in 1855, he moves to Paris um, and then eventually ends up in London. And this is the work that you're probably familiar with. Uh, most of the time people call it Whistler's mother uh, and it's of his mother that still lived in the United States. According to Jansen, its fame would have horrified Whistler who wanted the canvas to be appreciated for its formal qualities alone. So you might know it as Whistler's mother, but it's called arrangement in black and gray. So in other words, he saw things like Japanese prints and he thought it was really interesting that if you you don't really need the actual subject of the picture. Um, it's more a design on the canvas. So he was kind of thinking this is a big swath of black, that's a swath of gray, and he kind of liked the way that everything was balanced. So that's what he was more interested in. He wanted to do the same thing that people do with instrumental music. And you can kind of think of if you like a song, uh, especially if it's like a, a hip hop song or something like that, and you're like, what do I like about it? I can't really say the beat kind of speaks to me. Um, that's the same sort of idea. Or if you're a fan of classical music, um, you might think of some classical music in your head, but don't not exactly know why, like you would if a song had lyrics, um, why it appeals to you. So that's kind of the same effect he was going for, where it just appeals to the eye in the same way that music does in a kind of direct way. So going along with that, he uses musical terms. So nocturne is a musical term. It was a popular type of piano form at that time, like Chopin. If you look up nocturne and Chopin, you'll find some good pieces. In black and gold, the falling rocket. This piece is actually at the DIA. And if you go there, I think you'll find that um, it looks pretty different in person. I tried to get a reproduction that was pretty close, but I think in person it looks a, little, a lot more silvery. Uh, it's also harder to see the details in person. Um, it's a pretty small painting. So his idea was to make art for art's sake. In other words, even like the Impressionists and the Realists who are thinking, well, I'm doing this, other than he's trying to um, kind of just appeal to people, he doesn't believe that he has a message. You could argue, and I would, that that in itself, in itself is a message. It looks pretty or it appeals to people. Uh, but he was more going again for that musical effect. Um, and this painting, uh, the art critic John Ruskin, who's a big fan of saying that paintings should ennoble people, they should lift them up, they should teach them lessons. Uh, he said that this painting was like flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. And um, when you've heard, you probably have been hearing me talking like, what is this a picture of? So you might be able to understand a little bit, but it's actually fireworks. Uh, so think if you've been to a fireworks display, especially over water, which is a good way to do it, prevent fires. Uh, you can kind of see how the fireworks, when they fall down and they make that noise, uh, they look like this. Uh, and you can see a couple of people standing on the shore or sitting on the shore to look at the fireworks. So, um, so Whistler says it's an arrangement of line, form, and color first, and I make use of any incident of it which shall bring about a symmetrical result. In other words, he's like, I don't really care about the subject. I just like the, col the colors and the way they're arranged uh, in the lines. Um, so he actually sued John Ruskin because he was a, Ruskin was a pretty prominent critic for libel. Uh, so if you're not familiar, in the United States, there's pretty similar um, legal system as, as in the UK. Um, so he tries to sue this guy for libel. And libel basically means um, not that you can't say bad things about people. It's if you say something that isn't true 
and it makes it more difficult for that person to make a living, so to get paid. Um, so it's pretty sp specific. So if you just say, if you just talk so about somebody and say whatever you want, you know, about their mother, uh, that's not going to get you a libel suit. You have to show that it directly affected, that it was a lie, first off, and it also directly affected your ability to um, bring in an income. So at the um, trial, uh, <laughs> Whistler thought he was pretty clever. The lawyer was like, um, how long does this, this take to to do something like this. And Whistler's like, oh, I can bang one out in a day or two. Um, <laughs> and the lawyer says to Whistler, like, can you help me to see what's going on here? And he's like, it would be just as useless as me trying to pour music into the ear of a deaf man. <laughs> uh, so he tried to burn him a little bit. And um, Whistler actually ended up winning the case. Uh, but I think the jury might have thought that he was kind of frivolous with this because they gave him $1. Uh, and he had actually almost bankrupted himself <laughs> trying to get legal advice to try to win this case. So it didn't really work out for Whistler. Um, but the point was made. Um, to him, painting didn't have to be something that was lifting people up or doing something um, other than to look like a bunch of good stuff on a two-dimensional surface that's appealing to people. Uh, and we'll see that'll, that'll be become more prominent. And I guarantee you'll kind of understand this sort of appeal if you don't already. Uh, if you've ever been to an Ikea store, I'm sure you can kind of understand the appeal. So Whistler, he had to kind of like tone down his work a little bit. Uh, he's still making nocturnes, but as you can, you probably looked at this picture and could see right away what he's painting. It's over the lake and there's boats. Um, so he did have to be more conservative to sell some stuff. Uh, but again, the point was made, we're going to see more and more artists go um, be more avant-garde. In other words, get ahead of taste. Uh, so this is Eakins, another American. So the Americans were really influenced by what was going on in Paris. Some of them traveled back and forth. Uh, in the case of Eakins, he just trained in Paris and returned to the U.S., and he was a teacher. Um, so he didn't just want to be an artist. He wanted to teach people art. And it was a pretty important type of teacher, too, because he believed that women should be in art school as well. Uh, and at that time, um, and this was in Philadelphia, it was almost impossible for a woman in the United States because the United States was uh, pretty conservative when it came to gender politics at that time, and still is compared to Europe. Um, and so it was very difficult for women to get into school. And he's like, women should be able to, to be artists exactly like men. Um, so he mentored a lot of female artists, but he did run into problems sometimes. Um, for instance, when he was um, teaching women, it was really hard in the United States because the United States was a little bit um, more religious than in Europe and a little bit more repressed, I guess you could say. So it's hard to get nude models, which is a pretty standard thing for artists. Like if you take drawing classes at Henry Ford, you're gonna see live nude models come in, you'll be able to draw them. Um, but at this time it was pretty difficult. So he would actually, if a female student um, would come in and say, oh man, I couldn't you know, see these details around uh, you know, the, the pelvic bone or something like that. And he's like, here, I'll help you out. And he'd pull his pants down and say, go ahead and paint it. Um, so he got in trouble a little bit there. I don't, I don't think he was actually like making moves on his students or anything like that. Uh, but it was used as an excuse to, to perhaps um, undercut his teaching. So this is the Gross Clinic and the, the name is kind of coincidental. Uh, gross didn't mean that at the, at the time, what it means nowadays as in, ooh, gross. Uh, gross is the name of the doctor. And Gross was one of the first people to use um, ether um, in, um, in surgery. So to basically like put people out. Uh, and this was a big deal because before this time, if you wanted to perform surgery, it would hurt. And in some places, it would be pretty much impossible. So if you had to do an amputation, you would give them like whatever you could, like opiates or alcohol or something like that, and have them bite on something. And doctors would learn how to cut limbs off as quickly as possible. Um, but if it was the abdominals, you pretty much couldn't do it because when people are in pain, they tense their abdominals. Uh, so when they discovered anesthesia, 
um, in various ways uh, to basically put people out without killing them, which is a big deal. Um, surgery was able to move forward to what we eventually have today, uh, and surgery is is pretty advanced nowadays. So he's going for the same sort of effect with Corbet. He wants to show these things exactly as they are. So, um, you know, there's no romance necessarily here. There's a little bit of drama created by the darkness of the students in the background, um, but that's exactly what was there. <clears throat> and you can see all the gory details with them working on. Um, the the, <laughs> the patient this is like was probably not the best idea the patient's mother is right here uh she probably would have been better off they don't invite you in the operating room nowadays and there's a reason why you don't want to see that stuff you don't want to see how the sausage is made um so but it shows like a pretty normal reaction she would have if if this extremely new thing where you cut people into pieces and then reassemble them uh <laughs> If you see that in front of you, you know, and didn't know that it was done, it would be pretty scary. Um, so this particular picture, though, because it was kind of gross, for lack of a better word, uh, was rejected for the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. So normally, if you wanted to show a doctor, you wouldn't show them doing the things that they do if they're a surgeon because there's blood and um, it's kind of... Um, it can be disturbing if people haven't seen it. But part of what the realists remember want to do, some of them, is show things exactly as they are. Um, so I got to show you too, you get a little bit close in. Uh, and some of these techniques that were developed during this time period are still used today. Uh, so the doctors using spreaders so that they can get inside of the flesh more easily. And again, this sort of thing was really only possible with uh, anesthesia. You see the person with the, uh, they used to administer their anesthesia basically by soaking a rag and putting it on your face. Um, so with this one, um, again, he's showing new models. Uh, this one's a little bit less realist and more like you would see from academics. But the, the way it would be realist is that um, it's showing a studio and it's showing the work. But this is really more, less a part of that style and more like what you saw, saw with Vermeer. Um, so he also took photographs. When he got in trouble uh, with some of the students, he said, well, I use this new medium uh, and we can take photographs and we'll do it from multiple angles. And that way, if somebody can't have a nude model, like in other parts of the country, um, they could use these photographs and that way they could um, learn how to draw nudes. So the technology that developed and filmed during this time in photography uh, was pretty important. Before this time in photography, you may have noticed in old photographs that people always look like they have this mad expression on their face. Uh, and it's not because people in the 19th century were mad, it's because they had to stay really still. Uh, so if you've ever tried to take a picture with your um, iPhone or uh, Android phone and it was really dark, you may have noticed that uh, if you don't use a flash, it'll look kind of blurry. That's because your phone will expose uh, the shot a little bit longer. Um, so that anything that moves while it's being exposed uh, will look like a blur. Um, so that's the way all photography was. Uh, so when people had f photographs taken of themselves, they would try to try as still as possible, and smiling isn't the way they do it. Uh, so they would kind of grit their teeth, and that way they wouldn't move. Um, but eventually, they discovered how to do really short exposures, just a fraction of a second. Uh, and Edward Mybridge, who is... As far as how to pronounce his name, nobody really knows because the spelling of both his first and last name are just something he did to look, uh, I guess, fancier or something like that. Um, but uh, he used uh, very quick exposures. So just a fraction of a second, he got a hand of some of these and he's like, you know what we could do with this? We can stop motion of things uh, that we can't see. Uh, so there was a debate at this time with horses. Um, when horses are galloping, um, the first part of the, the debate was, do all four hooves come off the ground at the same time? That was the first thing. And then um, the second thing was, if they do come off the ground at the same time, uh, are the legs underneath the horse or are they spread out? Um, so at the edges where where the horse is kind of has their legs in the front and the back really far. So you probably already figured out what the answer was. We can see it in these two frames right here. Uh, the horse has all four hooves off the ground and it's when their legs are bent underneath them. 
Um, so Stanf Leland Stanford, who the college is named after, he was a governor of California. Uh, he was also a rich dude. Uh, Californians love their rich dude governors. Um, <clears throat> he uh, wanted to figure out what the answer to this question was. He had a bet with some of his friends. Uh, so he gave Moorbridge a bunch of money to set up, to buy these cameras and do a setup uh, to try to make this happen. Uh, Moorbridge was like, thanks for all this gear. Um, and what he did is he set up cameras. There's individual cameras for each of these frames that you see. And there's basically trip wires. Um, and the trip wires are hooked up to the camera and they snap a picture every time it goes by. Uh, so this is literally a individual camera for each of these frames uh, and it just goes do, 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 as it runs but down so i don't know if stanford won the bet or lost the bet um, but either way uh, he gave moorbridge some more money and moorbridge uh, kept using this technique uh, so scientists thought it was pretty interesting because they could study things by stopping motion in a way that they couldn't before this is before video uh, so he made an entire book that was called Animal Lo Locomotion, and he called this camera zoopraxiscope, which literally means looking at animals. Um, so in this one, the thing that's kind of weird, though, about this book is that you didn't necessarily, like if you had this book and you wanted to be scientific, uh, you would say it starts here goes this way and then starts this way but he didn't do that in the book so in a way it was kind of almost artistic even though he meant to be scientific uh, so some of the students they look at this and they try to figure out well where does it start and which way does it go i think most students have decided it starts on the top right corner and then goes like that um but i'm not sure uh you have to take a look at it closely you can see how there's a grid in the background again that's ostensibly to be scientific uh, but he also had pictures like this uh, so um, people are animals, so they're included in the animal locomotion. Uh, but and he has them nude because it's supposed to be scientific. Animals don't wear wear clothes. Um, but then some of them are, say, a nude woman jumping rope. And you might think, well, maybe this is a little something else and not quite so scientific. Uh, and he also had other ones where you'd have one woman with a big, big like giant um, jug of water, and she'd pour it over the other woman. Uh, so, so there were certainly people that probably bought this book for other reasons, but it is a cool piece of technology because it allowed people to see how they move. So another photographer that did this is Murray, but he did a little, a little bit different. He had one camera. He basically had set up like a machine gun and printed everything on one piece of paper. Um, so that was kind of cool. He called his chronophotographic. Uh, so chrono photography, um, in other words, time photography. Uh, so you can see he's got a pole vaulter here, and he starts here, and we see each element of the pole vault. Um, and he thought that was, was cool because it allowed scientists to see things a little bit more quickly. This is basically like a graph of motion. Um, so this is what his setup looked like. Like he's literally making it like a machine gun. He's got this the machine gun had been invented recently. He's got this device that's rapid fire taking the photographs. It does it on this round disc. And then you basically print it uh, on the paper by doing it in reverse um, and then projecting it onto a paper. So this is really cool. Um, and it may have influenced a guy in the painting that we saw before. We don't know. So if you think this is just one ballerina, then maybe that's the influence. Uh, maybe not. But he did something you might recognize if any of you are planning to get into uh, video games or video game production. You may have seen this technique used before. Uh, in video games, to get realistic motion, instead of trying to animate it um, with computer algorithms, uh, do it themselves. Instead, they'll film a real person um, and they'll just attach these sensors that are reflective uh, to them and have them wear all black. And that way, basically what it does is it eliminates all the extraneous information like your hair and skin, and it just shows the motion. And what they can do is they can take their animated figures and just plop them on top of the motion. It's basically just showing your bones and how they move. Uh, and then you can get realistic motion. And that's what Murray kind of figured out with photography. Remember I said uh, with photography, it can't get uh, the brightest of brights and the darkest of darks together. Uh, so he took advantage of that inability for photography to do that. When you take a photograph and you expose it so the white parts show, 
uh, it basically filters out all of the black and you get photographs like this. So this is super cool for scientists because they can see, they basically took out all the information they don't need. That's what scientists love. Uh, they wanna just get the information they need to see the motion. Um, but it also has kind of like a cool abstract effect. And even though both Murray and Moybridge uh, were going for a scientific effect uh, with these photographs, in the late 20th century, long after they were dead, uh, these sorts of photographs were displayed in art museums. Um, so they do turn out pretty beautiful, but again, you can see the motion uh, really well, uh, and it allows scientists to study motion a little bit more closely. Um, so this is Henry Asawa Turner. Uh, so the other thing that Eakins did besides um, train women to be artists, he also trained black people to be artists. Uh, so Henry O. Tanner was one of them. Um, he said everybody uh, should be able to go to school and get training in art. Um, so he studied in Philadelphia, uh, and then um, uh, Henry Asawa Tanner moved to Paris, because that's where stuff is happening. But he still did subjects that were close to him. Um, so he would do portraits of his family or people in his neighborhood. He was, um, he didn't, as you can kind of see from this picture, uh, this person isn't living in the best conditions, uh, but it's kind of showing the kinds of things you would do. Uh, maybe a grandpa showing his grandson um, how to play the banjo. Uh, so um, he was kind of influenced by Rembrandt. I think you can see it in that there's a lot of these quiet moments uh, and the paint handling is pretty soft. Uh, it kind of has this mysterious effect that we were talking about. So the last artist we're going to talk about in this section is the only sculptor we've talked about since Bernini in the 17th century. And you're probably wondering why I haven't talked about any. Uh, and that's because there really hasn't been much movement forward in sculpture in this entire time. Uh, and part of the reason why is that sculpture is very expensive. Uh, so it's harder to be avant-garde than it is with uh, painting, where you can buy the paints pretty cheap and you can do what you want, not necessarily worry about selling things. Uh, so Rodin, uh, to get around that effect, is he got really good at the standard types of uh, sculpture that everybody did. Um, and once he started to get a lot of commissions, he said, I, I want to do what I want, uh, but I don't think people will pay me. Uh, so he would just basically lie to these uh, people and organizations who were paying him to make these sculptures and say, I'm going to do this, which looks like exactly what they expected. And then he would just do whatever he wanted with the money. Uh, and sometimes that worked out and they would accept it and other times they wouldn't. Uh, but all of the pieces that he made were eventually made, um, if not during his life, uh, after he died. Uh, so Jansen says the first Western sculptor of genius since Bernini. I'm not a big fan of the word genius. Uh, I think what he's saying is basically Rodin moved things forward. Uh, and it's not like he was special. He just happened to be at the right time where it was possible to do so. Uh, and it was a pretty good hustler. So that helps if you want to make art. So he's rejected often in his early career, um, but you know, eventually got good enough that people pretty much had to pay him. So this is his most famous piece, uh, Le Pensora, The Thinker. Um, and he actually displayed just this piece uh, that you're looking at here at the Ecole des Arts Decoratifs in Paris. Uh, but his intention was that it was gonna be part of this big piece called The Gates of Hell um, about Dante, if you've ever read um, Dante's Inferno. Uh, it's a book about um, Dante taking an imaginary trip into hell. Um, so he originally, and I'll kind of uh, show you what it was supposed to look like in a moment, but um, people were really fascinated by this picture, just this sculpture just by itself. So he actually had it made a bunch of times and then the mold still existed. So after he died, it got made a bunch more times. Uh, so whenever you see these in museums and you're wondering, is that real? It's like, well, yeah, it comes from the same molds uh, that were used for this one. Uh, so his idea with his work is like, uh, he liked what the ancient Greeks did. Uh, they made bronzes um, and he liked what people had done in the Renaissance, especially Michelangelo by using the body to express things like we had seen before. Um, so he wanted to kind of continue that idea uh, and do it in a new way. Um, so this one is probably like a good example to use for it. Uh, what the thinker was originally going to be um, on the top of the gates of hell 
And it's important to know what he's thinking about. So the way that Dante set up his story, um, and I highly recommend the story if you get an idea to read it, uh, in this trip to hell, is he made the levels of hell as you go now into levels worse and worse. Uh, so basically, if you had sins that were really horrible, uh, you were at the lowest levels of hell. So for Dante, um, betrayal was the worst sin. Uh, so we had Judas and Brutus, the uh, murderer of Caesar, down at the bottom levels of hell. At the top levels of hell, though, he put people like ancient Greeks who didn't know what Jesus was. He was a Christian, so uh, he didn't try, quite put them in heaven. But um, at the lowest levels, he basically put people who were sinning by necessity. Uh, so in other words, think of like a poor person um, who becomes a robber uh, and maybe, you know, um, hurts a store owner or something while he's robbing. Like you can kind of understand why he's robbing if he's poor and he needs to like say feed his family. Uh, so you might not consider that a sin um, and it's kind of a borderline type of situation. And most of us through our life go through these types of borderline situations where we might have to do what we have to do um, to get something done or to protect somebody we love. Uh, but it's not necessarily what we would believe to be the right thing. So um, that's what the thinker is thinking about. He's thinking, these things that I had to do, um, are they going to land me in hell or are they going to land me in heaven? Um, so this is kind of like an epic struggle because remember for Christians, they believe that heaven and hell is forever. Um, so we can see the struggle. Like when we thought about Michelangelo, he would have like big hands um, and that would show kind of like uh, and big giant muscular bodies and that would show that they were doing important things. Uh, Rodin kind of takes that and takes it farther. We see uh, these muscles that seem to be flexing on a back that don't actually exist. It's like he's bubbling up with this conflict uh, and his face is just like bored into his hand. Um, so it's kind of amazing. This particular version of the thinker, as you can see, is damaged. Uh, and that's kind of a side story. Um, this is the one in Cleveland and still outside in Cleveland. Uh, there was this group of um, radicals called the Weathermen um, who did a lot of good things, um, but they were also um, kind of white and relatively privileged, um, so they didn't always do the best things. Um, <clears throat> um, but they were, were pretty good as far as, uh, they kind of had similar ideas to the people that were protesting the police or um, burning down the police station. Um, earlier this year. Uh, so the idea is they saw things that were wrong with society and decided to do something about it. But some of them kind of lost their way after a while and they decided, okay, we're going to destroy art and art museums because uh, that's where all the money's going to uh, and not to poor people, which is totally a good thing to say. I agree with it. Uh, but the way they went about it, trying to um, destroy some of these things probably wasn't the best. So they uh, set up some dynamite to try to blow this thing up. And what they did is they blew it off the stand, but they didn't destroy it. Um, and the Cleveland Museum of Art just said, kind of brushed it off and put it back where it was. <laughs> uh, so the thinker uh, did not let himself be disturbed um, by the weatherman trying to blow him up. Uh, so again, you can see the intensity. He's basically taking what Michelangelo did uh, and taking it even further. Um, he liked the unfinishedness. So a lot of uh, pieces that Michelangelo hadn't finished, uh, especially the one of Atlas holding the world, uh, he thought that was like an interesting point to be made, especially with Atlas. Atlas was unfinished, and that's kind of like what Atlas's job was. He has to support the Earth. He doesn't really even want to do it, but it's an endless job. It's never finished. Uh, so he kind of liked the idea of unfinishedness and how it could add meaning to a piece. Uh, so with this one... Um, he takes the unfinishedness idea and mixes it with the like old sculptures you can think of that were broken. Um, and he adds something to it. Um, and he does something pretty new. So he says in Michelangelo's unfinished marbles, he found his device of contrasting a highly finished, so you can see how things are totally like you would expect a sculpture to do, with the roughened or even natural stone from which it emerges. So in copying this, he does something that people hadn't done before. And that is um, make sculptures where there's missing body parts. Um, there's a very deep idea in Western culture, um, and it's somewhat, you see it in Islamic cultures and um, all the Abrahamic 
religion in, gen in general, the idea that God made your body perfect. Uh, so changing it isn't something you would do. Uh, so that's why people um, who are Christian didn't, didn't, you know, weren't allowed to do tattoos or whatever. Um, so by cutting out the body parts, that was kind of a taboo in art. Uh, but Rodin realized right away that if you do that, you can express something. Uh, you can kind of take out the extraneous and express what's necessary. So this figure, we don't need to see his expression to see that he's kind of tense uh, and arduous. We can see the tenseness of his legs. Uh, he doesn't need all these pieces. It's almost like he's walking. Uh, and despite losing all his pieces, like the Black Knight and uh, Monty Python, uh, he keeps moving on. So he continues with this and actually makes just individual body parts. And I think with this one, uh, like a lot of times when I bring this up, people see like the old horror movies where uh, you wonder if the slasher killer is dead and, and the last scene, they, the camera um, rolls over to his grave and then we see a hand pop out like this. Uh, and we can see that it's very expressive. Um, so Rodin's making this before those films. Those films were influenced by what Rodin is doing. Uh, so when I show you this hand, people often see it as like intensity, something is wrong, um, they might be in pain, uh, and he does that with the surface as well. These aren't normal human body parts, but by making it kind of bubbling it up, uh, it gives you a feeling, maybe more of a feeling than the entire body would. Um, so he treated it. Uh, bronze, you can get basically three different colors and by treating it with chemicals after, after it hardens. Uh, and he used them all <laughs> so he could get all three colors simultaneously. Again, something nobody had really done before. Um, so this last one, uh, it's good to tell a story. And by the way, I should mention, you can see copies of this one as well. And they're real copies. They're from the actual molds. Uh, so they're exactly what you're seeing here. Um, there's a really good version in Washington, D.C., in the mall, if you're ever there. Uh, and the Chicago Museum of Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, um, in New York. Uh, all of these have really good versions of this particular piece. So it's called the Burgers of Calais. And Rodin was commissioned this by the city of Calais. And it's to uh, reference um, something that happened the siege of Calais during 100 Years War. So 100 Years War is exactly what it sounds like. It was a war that lasted more than 100 years, actually, between France and England. Um, and as you might imagine, um, people didn't want to stop this war. Uh, so wars at that time weren't um, usually in Europe quite as brutal as, as like 20th century and 21st century warfare, uh, but it's still not something you want to go on you know, forever. And one of the most brutal techniques that people could use at that time were sieges. Uh, so sieges basically you surround a city or village um, or a city block or something like that. Uh, and you stop everything from coming in and you stop everybody from coming out. And the idea is, is basically that people are eventually going to starve. Um, so this is a way to, uh, you know, save um, soldiers uh, on the side that's attacking. Uh, but it's also a particularly brutal and torturous thing to do. Uh, so the British had done that in the city of Calais. Uh, and there was nothing that the French could do to um, get the British soldiers away. So the British said, well, we have an idea. Um, if you give us uh, five of your city leaders uh, and we're going to take them home with us, uh, we'll give up the siege. Uh, and since it was basically either five people or the entire city starving, um, they decide they would do so. Uh, and they did a lot amongst the important people. So burgers just means city people. Um, the word bourgeoisie uh, comes from that. So the idea is um, not just city people, but these are people that like are rather prominent. Um, they own businesses or, or whatnot. Um, so these uh, burgers um, volunteered uh, and you can pretty much guess what they're going to do. So the 14th century is England. Uh, they're going to be taken back to England. Uh, they were going to be tortured. Uh, then um, they were going to be killed uh, by being stretched out in the rack. Uh, and if you've ever seen the Mel Gibson movie Braveheart, you know what happens there. 
uh, and then afterwards their bodies would be drawn and quartered uh, and their heads would be put on pikes um, outside the city as a warning. Uh, so the idea with this is that um, the British wanted to get what they want eventually uh, by taking out some of these uh, prominent individuals. So this is um, Rodin, what he actually did is he gave the city of Calais a bunch of drawings that showed these burgers as heroic, you know, they're standing up straight and um, they're firm and, and you know, they're, um, they don't look like they're afraid. Uh, and then he made this <laughs> instead. Uh, and what his idea was is kind of like what the realists were doing. Uh, he wanted to show things how he thought they would really be. Uh, so all these men, they believe they're going to be tortured because uh, they are. <laughs> and he expected that people would react in different ways. Like this guy's kind of cursing. Um, this one looks like he's trying to hold back, showing emotion. Um, other ones are, are kind of just like looking downwards. Um, and you may notice that their arms are super long as they hold keys to the city. Uh, it's almost like they're weighed down and their limbs are stretched out by the weight of what they have to do. Um, so this was something new. And sometimes you'll see this in modern like war memorials. Uh, you'll see things being shown kind of more realistically. And it's still a controversial way to do things nowadays. Um, but Rodin continued with that, uh, including in his monuments, Balzac. So Balzac, uh, I know it's a really funny thing to say, uh, not for the French so much. So Balzac was a critic, uh, kind of like um, the critics that we looked at in, during the Enlightenment. Uh, and um, the French loved their critics. Uh, and he was commissioned um, after his death, obviously, uh, to um, celebrate Balzac, who's this kind of like great scholar hero. Um, and I don't really agree with Hamilton so much, and I'll kind of explain that in a moment. The first conspicuous sculpture portrait in modern times in which creative expression took precedence over verisimilitude. If you're not familiar, verisimilitude means, uh, it means literally a simulation of truth. Uh, so in other words, he's saying that the creative expression is um, more important than a simulation of truth. Um, and I don't think that's true. Um, so um, Balzac was known when he was writing to, like a lot of people um, who were kind of creative, he stayed up all night. Uh, and he slept all day and he worked all night um, by candlelight. And he would sometimes when he was working on something, not leave the house, not take a bath, not change his clothes or not even wear any clothes. He was kind of known to um, wrap a blanket around himself uh, when he was really working on things. And he would just kind of like need to take a walk in the middle of the night and go outside and basically totally naked except for this robe. Um, so that was something that everyone knew about Balzac, but they weren't expecting this type of sculpture. They expected, okay, he's a writer, so he's gonna be holding a book, and he's gonna be in a pen, and he's gonna be looking into the future with his hand upwards. Uh, but instead, uh, Rodin shows him what everybody knows about him, how he worked. Uh, so I kind of disagree with Hamilton here. In a way, this is more real than any sculpture had been done before. Um, so he actually had the molds made, uh, but the people that commissioned it were like, nope, we don't want a guy in his bed clothes and in a robe, even though that's exactly how he was. You know, we want the old school one. He should be wearing a suit. <laughs> uh, so it was never cast during Rodin's lifetime. Um, and like I said, this type of uh, sculpture that he was making is still kind of controversial. When people want to do memorials, sometimes they want their traditional ones, like a person on a horse or, or looking, you know, brave and all that stuff sort of thing. Now the ones they want to show, especially if the figure um, had something particular about them or uh, a difficult life, they want to show some of those difficulties. Uh, so this is something that still goes on today.